Here we go. Okay, so a couple of things. So I want to go back here just very briefly where we le left off with this. And I'm going to show you some, I have some slides, just Google some slides for x-rays of arthritis. I guess the best way to frame this is we're talking about bones and joints. That ain't all. Uh, the worst case I ever saw here. So we have all learned about rheumatoid arthritis. And I was uh, in my last year of school, before I started residency, about six of us went to the Philadelphia Hall once we had And so we were doing a four-hour rheumatology studies. We showed us all these interesting cases. We were medically very severe arthritis in the advanced arthritis. And if you ever gave us any black and white with me, it's all this. I said, listen, don't say anything we want to do. We'll talk about it when we get out. You come in, I'm going to talk to you. And we walked in, and there was this tiny entity in bed, legal position, and the only sound that was coming back that she made to wheel it, and you touched her. Boy, boy, the sound was startling. It was like, 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 and she was in a fetal position, I was, she couldn't have waited one second. Scary. And, and I, this is the reality. When you're talking about immunological disease, and, and, and I see look, most, of, most of the students I teach, so many nursing students, 80, 20, female, male, these are much more common in women than in men. Some of them are not. Ankylosing spondylitis, it's practically where I have a variation of psoriatic arthritis, but rheumatoid, systemic lupus erythematosus, uh, scleroderma, uh, all of those, sleep beyond that something, so they get called the Smith Burson syndrome. Uh, what's the guy his name? Uh, crazy singer, musical crazy, now he's married. Oh, so. yeah. No, he beats nothing. He's using so many drugs in his life. No, the young guy. Who's that guy? Who's that young guy? No, no, no. no, no. Don't come to me. Okay. He used to do like crazy stuff where he lived. You know, tons of money, tons of things. His name boyfriend. Who's that the name of the song? Was it Neighbor? Yeah. And so he. Apparently, he had a big book. I have been part of this. I don't know if this is really true. That was just paper. It's like that. But a long story short, this is the table. So, all of these diseases, I mean, it's nothing you haven't seen before. Developer. Okay? The developer. So, a normal distribution, Gaussian distribution, what it means, standard deviation from the mean. And 40, 40, and so rheumatoid arthritis. Ten percent of the people carry the diagnosis, whatever the criteria is. There's blood tests, radiological findings, and there's a lot of specific criteria that are, are, are find anywhere. And ten percent of people carry the diagnosis have absolutely no effect. They're just diagnosed. Forty percent of the people have some impact. It doesn't mean they can't work or be productive, but they're, they're, they're symptomatic, they require some treatment, some medication. That's the good hand, okay, where there's little or no limitations, certainly no limitations that would keep you being normal, productive, life span, etc. Forty percent of, now there's other half, this is the half you don't want to be in. 40% here, it affects this very important thing, ADLs. You know what those are? Activities of daily living. That's what occupation, you didn't wonder what occupational therapy was. It helps people, because most of these are for extremity. They deal with activities of daily living. Going to the bathroom, dressing yourself, washing yourself, brushing yourself. 
when you have a disease that affects you doing those things, it is extraordinarily impactful. I mean, you can't function like everybody else does. And that other 10% is the part that I was talking about. And she's probably more like that, the 1%. But it's so extraordinary that they're, they're, they're almost completely non functional even with That's a typical distribution of all sorts of immunological and we'll look at that with the immune system as well. Things like systemic lupus erythematosis, which is certainly more common than having that done. There's a lot of interesting stuff associated with this. And that just gives you a little idea of what's going on. Let me show you the distinction. And there is some misinformation. I, you know, again, the people who make the PowerPoints never treated somebody with this. Okay? So, <clears throat> pardon me. So here, understand that in osteoarthritis, we typically, even though you're going to see <clears throat> some osteoporosis, you're going to see areas in and around the joint where it's thick, radio dense, and I will show it to you now so you can see what I'm referring to. So x-ray, first part, osteoarthritis narrowing of the joint you can see how white it is in appearance that type of a thing that you can see there you can see how narrow it is and that's what they're trying to point to here the same way this is normal this is narrow and you can see it's radio dense that increased whiteness if you will you can look at the signs of deterioration that are present now it doesn't preclude other areas of bones being having a, as you can see here arthritically speaking where you can have here there's almost no joint space that's visible and typically larger joints are affected much more so than smaller joints so i mean you can take a look at these various arthritides and go from there this is rheumatoid now rheumatoid you're going to see they have an image of this a hand like that it's called fibular or ulnar drift it's almost like and I remember I was telling a little bit about the knee, how it pulls the kneecap. Same deal here. Bow stringing with the tendons because of the way they're aligned. Pulls the fingers or the toes in, a, in basically an outward over time. The joint, it starts with swelling. And typically you begin, you begin to see a lot less radio density that you can see here. Look at this. They become, this is when they truly sublux. It's really awful. So you can see some of the degrees of distortion that you can see here. That's not, I mean, I, I have seen all of those types of things that are present. And you can see it in both the fingers and the toes. Small joints, typically bilateral and symmetrical. A lot of, have, a lot of cases for joint replacement. You can see there's not a lot of bone density. Here's someone who already has an implant arthroplasty that's been done. Now here, and now what I have, psoriatic arthritis, and, and mine certainly not severe. Okay, but he, we, it, it really is highlighted by the distal interphalangeal joints, but it can occur in the axial skeleton as well. Just to give you some ideas, I, and I took it, and I still, and I hate having to inject myself every other week, the injection's easy, with uh, Umira, which is, and we'll learn about it in physiology, it's called anti-tumor necrosis factor. Embryol is kind of very similar to it. That was an older product. And what it does is it, it basically, you're trying, you're, you're, it's a, you're basically blocking something that gets rid of tumors, you know, and getting rid of tumors is a good thing. So it's a two edged sword. Now I'm fortunate I haven't had a problem. My first wife was taking Emerald. She interestingly had at least a diagnosis of psoriatic arthritis <coughs> and they were treating her for that. But unfortunately she had a very interesting disease that you may have heard about associated with somebody called the elephant. And not that she had that severe presentation, I'll tell you more about that, called neurofibromatosis. And so she formed nerve and fibrous tumors in various areas. With the embryo, she formed a softball-sized tumor in her abdomen. She was on the embryo. This was, and she had it removed back in 2004. And, and she, my first wife had, who we, we were still in contact quite a bit, uh, a very, very checkered medical history. Just to give, so I have a lot of familiarity with this. Now, I'm fortunate. Because that really didn't rear its ugly head in me until the last eight years or so. And what probably brought it on 
was they started treating my bladder cancer with immunotherapy. So it's trying to ramp up your immune system. And again, it's a two-edged sword. Now, if you have a tendency to get an inflammatory arthritis, now you're in trouble. Again, not the word I would have chosen for that. One of those more definitive words. So this is what that looks like. Bilateral, a lot of other things. I'm anemic. Uh, When we get to the blood unit, I'll give you chapter and verse about that. Starts with a swelling and inflammation. And these cells, white blood cells, chemicals that destroy joints swelling and then and something adheres to the cartilage called panis which is uh, a sort of accumulation of bloody type stuff I, I skipped through that sorry clings to that and the term when a joint fuses because of disease is called ankylosis when we fuse a joint intentionally for stability it's called art the procedure is called arthrodesis so you put the bone edges together scrape off the cartilage pin them so it's a little bit different and then and here you can see some agents target tumor necrosis factors exactly what i was telling you about blocking the action joint prostheses are used steroidal and and the same the treatments are very very similar the disease entities are not by any and there you can see the the grossly distorted joints you get rheumatoid nodules filled with fluid nodules out pouching of joints very deforming very painful Here's the uric acid one, more common men. Uh, it's untreated, awful, like I said, life-threatening. And then they look at these kinds of like rich foods. No, I don't necessarily mind sardines. That, that oily fish kind of a thing. I'm going to be I love salmon. I have got a great salmon with gremolata recipe. And just for the sake of completeness, Lyme disease. Okay? So Lyme disease, it's, 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 I do not, did you get into it all in micro? Anybody? No? Okay. Lyme is, is a blood-borne spirochetal disease that is unfortunately transferred to us as an inadvertent host from other infected animals. And the tick is a vector. So it's what's called a biological vector. It it seeks a blood meal on an infected dog or rodent. And then that tick, basically, it's called a deer tick. It's part of its life cycle is to reproduce a two-year life cycle on deer. Unfortunately, when when they grow after the first year and they metamorph into these nymph ticks, then they jump off the tick. They're looking for a blood meal. They're hungry before eventually they reproduce and die on the, on the deer in the second year, or the end of the second year of their life. We're an accidental host. And it's not, you wouldn't see, it's much, this is still in the season for, it's late spring, all summer, early fall. Once it gets real cold, they've already on the deer. And we have deer everywhere here. And we have ticks everywhere here. I mean, I live in, that Cranberry Township is tick central. It's not fun. And the trouble is why they're classifying it. It's an inflammatory disease that has a predilection for joints and nervous system and muscle tissue. I had a very interesting case and down the road. I'll probably go into it about a young woman who ended up nearly paralyzed from this. In the old days, we used to call it tick paralysis. And if you don't get it early on, very long course of antibiotics. I, I hope my wife may still have a picture. She got a tick bite during the lockdown, 2020, and she got the classic, it's called a bullseye or a target rash on her, on her upper thigh. And she got it. I mean, she went to the Med Express, showed them that, and they were like, do you want to take pictures? Lyme disease. So she, unfortunately, they got the antibiotics in early and she did very well. My late dog, Ralph, who I have to show you pictures of, what a courageous battle with Lyme disease. He didn't succumb to that. Ralph was special. I know. I still have trouble thinking about it. I was in tears. I'll get a picture. You'll be lucky if you get the cat. You're terrible. You just yelled at me. It's okay. Yeah, who else would I yell at? I don't know. All right. Moving on. So much for that. Why am I having so much 
fun with this class. I don't know, Zion, but everyone in here is having so much fun too. So. It's, I, I, my only concern is it's two things. One, I want you to have fun. But two, I want you to learn stuff. I mean, that, that's really the, and we'll find out soon whether or not that's the case. <laughs> it reestablishes the relationship of teacher and student. Uh, what's the what's the format? The format is scantrons, pencils, and I you didn't listen to it yet. Multiple choice, true false. I don't think there's any matching. Got it. And remember, it's Stein's modified matching. Could be, that means could be used once, twice, or not at all. Oh, or true and false, where I like to call twos and loops. And my multiple choices are like A, B, C, A and B, A, B and C. But then we would then we wouldn't be anywhere near as much fun. I know you could you could you could share the wealth, so to speak. I was born at night, not last night. I know it's yeah yeah collaborative efforts. Sooner or later, many of you are going to have to take a licensure exam. You can't collaborate. It's the way it works. I've got I've taken more freaking exams, word certifications, all that stuff. Do you format your test based on? Um, no. Do they have questions like that. I have some interesting questions. Oh, I have lots of those. But I'm saying, do the exams have? Yes, multiple multiples. Haven't you ever seen a multiple, multiple choice? I don't do the, the ones where it gives you like, they give you a statement, then they give you three responses, and it's one, one and two, one and three, one, two, that kind of stuff. I don't do those. But those are called multiple, multiple. There's four levels of objective exams. Okay? So, I mean, that's a level four. There's like six levels. Have you ever take a course in ed psych, educational psychology? You should do that. They don't have it here. It's great. Because <laughs> what do you know what they call wrong answers on a test like that? Distractors. They're designed to distract you. You have to make it plausible. Uh, think the only good thing I am is a very good test taker. Oh, I'm not fine. So. Yeah, I, 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 I know. I, I, not you. I, most of the students here, the big problem they get is test taking anxiety and bad test taking skills the biggest single problem they don't read the question you've got to learn to read you've got to look for keywords and questions ands and ors don't mean the same thing keywords mean different things there's certain trigger words when you get used to doing that you'll get there it's it's, it's, it's a lifelong learning skill I, i'm lucky i always had it I, I can't tell you why. All right, moving on. We're going to talk. We're going to talk girdles. Huh? Uh, who doesn't? It's 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 an it's an older age. Okay, so they have the, the, the two bone unit for the shoulder is the pectoral girdle. The three bone fused unit is the pelvic girdle. So, and they, by definition, connectors are part of the appendicular skeleton. So, clavicles and scapula. And I talked about it, but we didn't get a chance to listen to the thing, to the recording that I had done the other day. You can tell how much healthier it's happening. Where are the appendicular here? Oh, here. This is a pectoral girdle. Clavicle. Okay, so how do you know which is which? Well, this is the shoulder blade, the spine, the scapula. It sits here in the clavicle, it's like this, and then it comes down, like so. So they function as a unit. This is the attachment. This is that rather, rather shallow cavity called the glenoid. So if you look at the bone, you see a few key features that are there. The upper process is the acromion process. This is the coracoid process. Really important for attachment to muscles. It's sort of like a hollow area here 
This is called the subscapular fossa. It's indented, and that's where the fossa and subscapular get kind of comes a little bit down. The spine posteriorly divides it to a fossa above it and one below it. Supraspinous fossa and infraspinous. The rotator cuff that it's all about and stabilizes the shoulder. Those are three of the muscles. Subscapularis, supraspinatus, infraspinatus. Three muscles on the back, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and posterior minor muscles. And in the front, the only anterior stability, subscapularis, they can all insert to the head of the humerus. That's why they're in the rotator cuff. Not a whole lot, but the clavicle is really a modified long bone. It has a chromial end and a sternal end to it, but that's really what have to know. This is the attachment here to the sternum. It's the whole attachment of the upper extremity of the uterus. One song. So this is another one of those joints that has a piece of cartilage in it, a little distance because of all that. It's all about mobility. Where you get the lower extremity, it's all about stability. So attachment to all the muscles, great degree of mobility. The scapula are not attached to the actual skeleton. Yeah, this, is fun. this is a very famous chromio pulvicular joint. So who was the guy who went down your shoulder, uh, car, you're not playing from your world all the weekend, their car. car. And, and, and this is happening Aaron Rodgers from the title of town. Most frequently fractured on the body. But, so when you go down, each one of these guys get tackled and they go down their arm like that. You worry about fractured clavicle and you worry about AC separation. So that's a shoulder separation, chromial clavicular. So a little bit, grade one, a little bit more grade two, really separate. That's how that works. And again, this area here is important too because of the attachment to the joint. And I did that with the joints. God, it's getting dark early. My wife sent me an image. Oh! It's, it's a raccoon in the backyard. Yeah. Sure. Oh, gosh, I got to show... Oh, you know, you're ridiculous. <laughs> eh, it's because I like this group. Oh, you're, you're, you're my... Oh, you'll love this. That was, that's not a raccoon. That's a, that's, it's a beaver, I think. In your yard? Her, no, my, my mother-in-law where the flood and the stuff was. Oh, it's a, it's a, I think it's a beaver because they're right on the water. No, not, not just beaver, not beaver. Ugh, I hate people. What's the difference? Between what, a raccoon and a beaver? No, beaver and beaver. It's a, it's a marsupial. No. They're rodents. They're, they're oh, they're rodents. That's right. Which, which is the mar isn't it rac marsupial? No, the opossum is the marsupial. Oh, not possum, but oh, opossum. Yeah, that's all right. That's why. That's why we have Dr. Hannah here. She she knows what she's doing. Oh, give me the picture. Didn't come up yet. Oh, is this terrible? There it is. There it is. Oh, it's a groundhog. See you soon. It is a, I think you're right. They're bigger than you think. Have you ever been to Gobbler's Knob? Gobbler's Knob? Tawny Phil, where they have the big ceremony. How fast do they keep you? Yes. Of course. Because my sister-in-law has a, has a three mall stores at the Du Bois Mall, and we, we stayed up there. And we did. And my mother-in-law at the time, which was about twelve years ago, wants to see Gobbler's Knob, so we went. Yeah. How often do they replace it? I, I don't know how often they do. Yeah, we didn't we didn't go there. We weren't there for too cold for that day. Moving on, you're distracting me. Okay, so. Scapula or not attached in the socket. So here they are, chromioclavicular joint, shoulder separation there, shoulder dislocation here. And as you can see, with the acromium and the, and the coracoid process, 
a lot more protection posteriorly, superiorly. So we have more to do here. Clavicle, sternal, and acromial end, not a whole lot to say. Yeah, they got, I mean, there's a little tubercle on it, don't care. The scapula. Okay, and, and the, it has a lot of anatomy, but I, to, I'm just telling, I don't worry, I'm not worry about the angles. The spine, okay, shoulder blade, the acromium, the coracoid process. There's a little notch that's here. That's the suprascapular notch. You can see it here, the glenoid cavity where the articulation is. These are the fossa posteriorly. So there's not a lot to say. This is interesting because now you can see the supraspinous and infraspinous and subscapular fossa. This is the glenoid, but really it's much flatter. This is more or less the labrum, this fibrocartilaginous lip that we also have on the hip. So when you hear about a labral tear for an athlete, and this was part of what I, I, in that presentation I recorded, and hopefully you'll be able to play it and we can figure this out. Okay, that's the pectoral girdle. Now, and the arm and the leg are interesting in the sense that they are very, very much uh, related in the sense that you have basically this kind of assembly. You have one bone and the larger portion of the arm at the top. Humerus here, leave you there. And then you have two bones here with that interosseous membrane holding them together. So you have radius and ulna. So if you look at it this way, how do you know which it is? Where? Wherever you see that notch, like in the, in the lower extremity, has the superior fine dream. This is the area called the electronic velocity. And you always know that the cartilage is heading in this old because to be here. So we're looking at it like that. Okay, so you can, over here, the ulna will be medial for you, a little finger in the radius. So let me get a better one to demonstrate. Well, it's a real bone, but it's a little less beat up. This is one on the right. Okay, so where's the anatomy? You have the head. Wherever you have a head, you always have a neck. It's much more impressive on the femur for that rather distinctive neck. And there's something called the surgical neck and the anatomical. The anatomical neck is immediately behind the head, and the surgical neck is a little bit different. But I had it in the surgical sense that would be different by the uh, So I'm going to have I, I put a label on it. This rough in the area here on the outer aspect is called the deltoid tuberosity, where that big, powerful deltoid muscle is and back and along the side, where you typically get a lot of infections. So that creates a little tuberosity there. So, and then you might remember, and, I, and again, this is not a great specimen. Maybe it'll be a little better right here. Where's the plastic one? And we'll show you. And then the plastic one might be a little easier to look. So here you can see the greater and lesser tubercle in the other way around. And the east of the circular groove is there. And this should be what I was talking about that long tendon that goes up. And then really the most important area is down below. Because you have two bones. And so this is medial and not just posterior. That will have an velocity. These are, these are very distinct. This is the medial and lateral endocontinent. They're not part of the joint. These are the big attachments for flexors and extensions. We call this the common flexor origin. So those muscles that do that, like the flexor wrist. All come here from four, and if I'm four, I'm not quite strong on the extension area, the flexible result. This is the ulnar notch, and this is where the ulnar nerve, the funny bone, is right against the bone, and it hurts so much when you go back. Two condyles, specific names. This is the trochlea, which looks like a pole, and this is called the tension. This is the cap. And on top of the cap, and I'll try to get you a better bone space. Try to do it so No, you're driving me bananas. Bananas is good. So even though these are unmade bones, this is the radius. So it's not like this mushroom cap. And that's what sits in, and I'm sure there's plenty of these to demonstrate. 
here's the pixel on and here's the mushroom shaped cap at the head of the radius so it puts on a head for God's sake. And here you can see the opposite side very distinctly that fully shaped and sort of a baby shape with a notch that protrudes in the middle and so makes this such a distinct right angle type of joint why it's really a pure English type of joint it's in the bottom do this because if you can hold that elbow, most of you get here is coming from the relationship of these two bones. That's an interesting articulation of a pivot between the head of the radius and the little area in there called the radial bone. Now, see, I should have to put a fair ball in that. This is the ulna, this is the one that's going to your pinky. Okay? You got a big U. Be an ulna, this is the electron process, and this is that in the back of the fossa. This is that trochlear surface or trochlear knife with the little ridges in it, covering part of it. This area that I'm pointing to with the arrow, that's, that's called the radial notch. We name things anatomically, not necessarily always by the bone, but by but what goes in there. The head of the radius fits into the radial notch. That's a good one. Welcome. Me too, son. So, you saw the Oh. Lego games and stuff. Those are good ones. Yeah, the logs are a little cafe. I have a lot of Lego games. So, I have an anatomy question. Go ahead. Okay. So, whenever you're like double jointed, Right. One of your, your bones. Like, bring that arm back out. No, 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 the full arm. Yes, yes. Um, whenever it gets double jointed, does it look the same? Or is it all yeah, it gets the same. Double jointedness, the term that most orthopedists will tell you they call it either ligamentous laxity or hyperligamentous. Oh, it means that the ligaments themselves are inherently stretchy. And to people who can do this, like they can try your stomach and bend it all the way back. I can't, I don't know. But that's, you know, there, there are some folks like I have seen the, the most elaborate one of those. You know, you, you should see it inside, you should see your rubber hands. That's called Baylor Danlos syndrome. And I saw one of those at the Bex Hospital. So, I mean, the skin is like that. Oh! And you can pull it. You couldn't sit in the needle. They have to incise it to give him something to start in the piece. It's crazy. And there's some variations, one of the most famous variations of that is connected tissue. It's called Marfan syndrome. That would be Abraham Lincoln. Very famous basketball volleyball player, he was eight foot up, he was four behind him. He was six eight. Uh, some of these very tall volleyball basketball players. The Marfans are very elongated. It's connected tissue that frequently die young, like she did. And another guy did of uh uh some anywhere in public. I think it's probably the most <laughs> So moving on, I'm almost there. So those are the, so let me show you some of the other structures. So there's some pretty good ones I've shown you before that you can see those structures that are there. And then, and I, and I have some better, I, I'm, when I have these out for the practical, we use better ones, I'll find them. So this is a very good example of the radial head. On the radius, the big muscles here, the biceps, the biceps, the brachii, the brachialis, insert here, it's called the radial tuberosity, where those muscles insert. And then down here, so imagine we're on the thumb side, so it's three point back. Okay, that is called the siloed process. So it's like a little point that you and I can feel. When somebody oh, I hurt my wrist, they're pointing here. That's really just a radius. So you have an older siloed and a radial side. You have a radial notch, a radial head, an electron process, radial side. Those are all terms. Parts of bone that you need to be familiar with. Oh, I'm having such a good time. So the humerus, largest and longest bone, articulates 
I have a funny mnemonic that's a little off color, and I will share it with you shortly. Okay, head, anatomical neck, right behind the head. The surgical neck's a little farther, more distal. Greater tubercle and lesser tubercle, and you'll see that. And you'll see all of these little uh, little guys that are here very, very short, easier to show up on them. So here you can have, again, the greater tubercle, not because it's necessarily bigger, it's higher, and the lesser tubercle because it's lower in the anatomical position. The intertubercular groove, looking at it, this is the anterior aspect. The large, distinct medial epicondyle, the, la the lateral epicondyle is a very, very tiny point. Here's the capitulum, here's the trochlea, Here's the olecranon process. The olecranon process sits in there from the ulna, and that's why it's a rigid block. You can't hyper, you shouldn't be able to hyperextend. Deltoid tuberosity over here. Surgical neck, you can see it's farther down. And yeah, that is where I've seen humeral fractures are bad. My sister in law, within the last year, lost her balance. She's a little older, she's about a year older than I am and put her arm down, fractured it here. It was such a mess. It's taken about six months, minimum. I mean, obviously being older and things like that, but that's a nasty fracture if this person get older. This is a bad area, it's called the supracondylar above the condyle fracture. And then you have to really be careful with circulation impairment. It's scary, particularly if it dislocates, it's displaced. Here's that arrangement, capitulum, head of the radius, and the head of the radius there and the radial notch, that allows the pivoting. Here you can see the ulna. I've got to give her a knot yet. My wife, done working? No. It's all right. I wouldn't have married me. She did. At least you're self-aware. I try to be. I, I keep I, I keep talking to her. I say, who told you to marry some old guy? Is she young? Compared to what? Compared seven years. You. Seven years Compared younger. Years, you low from seven years younger than I. Oh, okay. uh, you want the picture? Uh, I mean, yeah, yeah. Oh God, here we go again. I have a favorite picture. Of her or of you? Of, uh, it was both of us. I, I have no favorite pictures of me because I'm not photogenic. I have a picture of Penny from Houston. How did you get that? <laughs> we got to stop. People are going to talk. I didn't blow up the cruise ship. Oh my goodness, it's from 7,000 years ago. Ugh. Ugh. Oh my goodness. I have a lot of pictures of the dog. A lot of pictures of the dog. I'm getting here. I apologize. It's her fault. Take a mental health break. This is ridiculous. Ooh, 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 got it. Now this is a, this is a, to be fair, this is four years ago. And you can, oh, come on, how long does it take to download? It's ridiculous. Okay. How can I have that? That's ridiculous. How can I have that many megabytes? I don't know anything about this stuff. Here, all right, here we go. Me. There you are. This is my favorite picture. Hey, see, you see the glasses? Visually impaired. Oh, that's Why would she be with me? You probably knocked her glasses off and then had her. You saw a dog. I, I, my, now that's my granddaughter, very young. My younger granddaughter. I'm. Fortunate. I, I hey, I, like I said, what is she doing with some old guy? She always wanted to marry. Her comment to me was, 
the two things I value most are intelligence and wit. It's the only thing I have in abundance. Oh, you're talking about Yeah, I uh, Well, I'm halfway there. I'm halfway. Stop it. You're, I'm going through my armamentarium of funny stuff. So here's the electron. That's the bony block from extending your elbow. So you can see all of these structures. So the ray, I mean, again, interosseous membrane connects. The ulna is technically longer. The, at the back, you always can see behind that notch that's there. And you'll see them, again, a little bit better when I show them to you. So here you, again, can see that the olecranon, this little coronoid process is, is, again, a bony block for flexion. There's a small styloid sort of on your pinky side. The head of the radius, the tuberosity on the radius, that's where the attachment of the biceps muscles, and then a fairly distinctive radial styloid. There's the interosseous membrane, a bit more flexible. So they show it to you here. Again, this is that radial notch where the head of the radius joins up. These are the articulation of a little bit ulnar, but most of that large radial distal aspect. So the ulnar head is distal, but the radial head is proximal. This is most of your wrist bones articulate here, just a little bit there. And when somebody falls, typically you fall and you put your hands down, the distal radius fractures up, or it's called a collie's fracture. Older people, they can't, sometimes they can't do it, so they fall this way, it's called a reverse collie's. We, we treated so many of those, I can't even get tired. Which brings us to this next set of bones. There are eight. And these eight bones are an equator range. Normally go medial to lateral. Here it's a little bit easier to go lateral. Like two rows, and they're somewhat curved like that. It allows your wrist collectively to be somewhat of a condyloid joint, so you can go up and down. ADW and ADW. You have those four bones. You have a proximal row and you have a distal row. Okay. Okay. Those are the initials. When you do a mnemonic, and this one's very common, typically you take an initial. So SLTP. T, T, C, H. Some, uh, it's a little off color, lovers try positions. Oh. Stop. That they cannot handle. Okay? Okay. They were in gloves? Yeah, you, I have like extremely bored for like five minutes. And they think I'm crazy. So here are the names. Scaphoid, lunate. Scaphoid, because when you hold the wrist up, and I have it. I have an actual wrist that's even a little better than this. Sort of like you know, a, a goat bone. So you can see that the scaphoid is the kind of sits the highest, like a scaphoid. Lunate, because it was room shaped. Frank Fletcher had no idea. And this little guy is called the pizza form. <coughs> and it looks like a little pea. And I was, I'm not sure, I'm not going to find the word. That, that's really my, one of my favorite bone specimens. It's here somewhere. So we'll use this one instead. This is it. Okay, so scaphoid, lunate, triplexal, pizza form. It's, it's like the kneecap, it's a sesamoid bone. And in fact, it's forms a little tendon, so it's not really completely attached. And it's almost like at the heel of your hand, not quite the bump here, not quite up here, but sort of right there, same. just the wrong way. And then the next group, the trapezium, is perhaps the most interesting. In the sense, and it's unfortunately, it, it, this is the one that makes up this, I'm not to show it to you, model. This is the one, and I think it's the only joint left this side of the body. The saddle joint allows you to close your thumb. The trapezium 
it's like a saddle shape this way and a saddle shape sort of made into it that way. They're allowed almost at the long side, but not twice. So yes, it's an easy and a trapezoid. Okay. And then you have a capitate. And the one that's unique for the feature is called the hammock. That little shelf of bones is kind of going to kill your hand. That's called the hamulus of the hammock. That's another one. You put your hand down, you notice. We're on a roll. So, as you can see, the scaphoid, lunate, and triquetrum, they're technically the wrist. Scaphoid and lunate articulate with the radius, triquetrum, with the ulna. And again, the pisiform is sort of separate. It's in a tendon. So it's a little new. And then after that, it's pretty straightforward. You have, I mean, I don't care, metacarpals, at one through five, bases and heads, phalanges, the pollux or thumb has no middle phalanx, just proximal and distal two bones. All the others, and the same for the foot, have three, distal, middle, and proximal. So, and I use this illustration a lot, okay? So be wary of that. So here you can see it's scaphoid, lunate, triquetral, trapeziform. And then you have the trapezium, trapezoid, capitate, and hamate. And, that, and they're trying to show you that hamulus or the ridge that's on the hammy. It's a little difficult to see most of the time. And, and they form the undersurface of those bones as part of the carpal tunnel. And we'll get to what's in the carpal tunnel when we look at the muscles, tendon complexes that are there. Very common. But it's like little tunnels. It has to go along with like those uh, tendon the tendon sheets, they're in little enclosures. And if there's swelling or trauma, not a lot of places to go. And a lot of people get varying degrees of carpal tunnel. Yeah, too many people were operated. It was one of the things that was overly operated. Now to establish if it needs surgery, you have to do what's called electrodiagnostic studies. You have to, you have to show the severity of the electrical malfunction. And we actually do a little of that tech stuff in physiology we're going to do, maybe we'll do it here. Because uh, we're going to start doing the brain after the bones. Is, uh, we'll just, you know, like uh, electromyographic studies. And which brings us to the lower extremity and now the hips. Look at this. Ah, this is the hip. So, we have a couple of these real ones that are articulated. So the hip bone or hip assembly here and here, hip bone most known as the honest coccyx, we bone, wired elevated bone is building, wired part you all sitting on the ischium, this is called the pubic, the other pubic, that's what it is in there. They all participate in this very distinctly large size. So there's a lot of other anatomy. This is the iliac crest. Okay, the hands are tipped. That's where you feel it. And there's a roughened area that I can have a separate one, and I'm a fine one for another time. That has that uh, painted area to the sacrum, the ridges of surface is here right here. Together, the sacrum and the ilium, the sacrum iliac crest. And basically, this large notch called the greater sciatic notch. And this is the lesser side of the body. This is the spine, this is the velocity. This is called the obturator brain, the one that has structure that passes through that. And that's the major anatomy of those areas. But it's so important forensically, as you will see. So, there you can see the same thing. This is called the pubic arch. We look at this. And we look at the, the shape of the inlet and the outlet, the opening going in and the opening going out. If all we have is bones or just one bone or a piece of bone to determine the gender, because this is really the critical and the femur to a certain extent as well. So there's a lot of structures. We'll talk about the anterior superior spine. That's the attachment of the sartorius muscle. The anterior inferior spine is, is the superior attachment of the rectus femoris. So there's a lot of structures that are there. We could spend 
days going over all the anatomy. I had did a whole some a whole year course in nothing but lower extremity anatomy. Every little notch, nook, cranny structure. And I had the privilege of being taught by the man who was considered the greatest expert at the time, living expert on the anatomy of the lower extremity in his last class. So, the auricular surface, the ischium, pubis, you see it, all the different structures I was talking about, you can review. So we'll take a look at all those when we get to all those bones. So this is a good illustration, the iliac crest, the whole area, your spines, anterior, superior and inferior, back and forward attachments, the notch, ischial spine, the tuberosity, obturator foramen, you can see by color, all participating in the acetabulum. That are there, and these wings are called rami. And there's rami on the ischium and there's rami on the pubis. If not, not that I would ask you about that. And this is what that ear-shaped auricular surface that's sort of like imagine the cox of the sacrum being in there as we look from the outside or the lateral view rather than another view. The pelvis itself, female pelvis, wider, shallower, lighter, rounder childbearing. So you have an inlet and an outlet. And again, for this course, we're not going to go on to that. So you get an idea. The false pelvis is sort of this upper area but this is really the key idea when we look at the inlet and the outlet that are there. So you can take a look at them, and this is the critical piece, the arch. In women, and you can see how wide it is. So that angle, 80 to 90 degrees here, even this would even be larger. This, much less, much more acute, 50 to 60 degrees. So you can see the bone density or the thickness or the heaviness, the tilt. As you can see, it's tilted more forward. And you'll see some of these illustrations. So in a female, again, you can begin to look at the tilt that's, that's there. And you can see the proximity of the sacrum and the coccyx to the ischial tuberosity. See how close it is here? Not so close here. It creates a larger outlet for childbirth. And it's, it, it, it's, it's just remarkable, the, the way it is. So take a look. When we see the, let's say, the circumference and diameter of the opening as opposed to here and the shape itself. That's why it's so, and what goes along with it is the angle of the head and neck of the femur. If the head and neck of the femur is 125 to 135, if it's more on the 135, that side typically male. If it's a little bit closer to the right angle, typically female. So if we just have a bone, you can, start, you can age the bone. You can determine that. So let's say we're looking for a missing. There was a famous case in Washington. Uh, her name was Chandra Levy. And she was an aide to one of the congressmen. And there's you know, the question, were they having an affair or whatever? Not that that, but eventually they took about a year. They found her remains in one of those large parks in D.C. So there was quite a lot going on there some time ago. So, uh, you know, those type of things, which brings us thankfully, nearly to the end. So we have, just like the upper extremity, arm, forearm, and wrist apparatus, we have thigh, leg, and foot. Largest, longest, and strongest bone. How do you get the height? You have a femur, multiply by four. Okay? So it's in the hip and distally with the tibia and patella. Notice, not the fibula. I'm, it's a pet peeve. It's like larynx and pharynx. I hate that. No, it's larynx and pharynx. There's tibia and fibula. There's not fibia and tibula. <clears throat> Sorry. No, I, I, everybody has those. It's like all the stupid commercials in the game. I'm turning off the commercials and the you know the Monday night, Sunday night theme. So I like Harry Underwood as much as the next person. So. In the head of the femur, and I commented on this, with regard to the joint, there's called the fovea capitis femoris. It's where the main blood supply to the head. That, when it's interrupted, very significant injury. There's a lot of growth deformities that I don't get into in this course that involve interruptions of blood supply. And this is one that happens in adults 
and it can cause the collapse of the head of the femur. There's growth diseases, uh, one called Perthes disease that my cousin had that uh, really limited him and ended up having to get hip and knee surgery. So, uh, I mean, he's a fellow now in his 60s. But I mean, the treatment then was you couldn't sit or stand. He had to be lying down or partially lying down for about four years. In a brace. Went between like seven and 11. Uh, which is very interesting. That, and, and there's varying presentations. This one, and it was like, if you didn't listen to the video, it, I commented on this. This affected the, maybe the, they have a stats all the time. The most yardage gained for a running back per play, historically, like 5.8, Bo Jackson. He and Herschel Walker, the two best natural athletes I've ever seen running back. And he got hit out of bounds. It ruptured this vessel and it collapsed the head. And he ended up having to have hip replacement surgery. Ended his career, two sport athlete, all star, two sports. MVP of the all star game in 88. Climbed the wall to make a ridiculous circus catch. And I mean, just plays where Bob was the mind and very innocently hit. You saw the trochanters, I'll show them to you again. The intertrochanteric line, important because of hip fractures. And I'll show you the other structures that are part of it. So, moving on. So, here we are. And I'll get the, the femur out again. The fovea is this indentation in the head. The, and so, this has a very distinct anatomical neck here and a very large surgical neck. Greater and lesser trochanters, very visible. They have a crest or a line, a crest that's posterior, a line that's anterior, not that that matters. And this is called the gluteal tuberosity, the large gluteal muscles, gluteus maximus and gluteus medius that you're sitting on that help you extend your leg attached there. Those muscles that I commented on earlier around the knee, the vasti, even though they're anterior, they kind of grab onto this area and form a line called the linea aspera. So posteriorly, that large notch, this is the intercondylar fossa. This is one half of the popliteal fossa. Anteriorly, you have this anterior space. This is the articular surface for the patella. You have epicondyles for the collateral ligaments. And so you have medial and lateral condyle. Here you can see the patella, the posterior surface, covered in cartilage, the anterior roughened, because it's sitting inside of the tendon. So you can see it the way it's articulated here. And it gives you a good idea. So I'll, and I'll show you these on the bone itself. Tibia and fibula, uh, these are easy. It's easier to see the anatomy in the lower extremity because it's bigger. It's very easy to see these things. And the tibia and the fibula, the interosseous membrane is very tough. They don't rotate. Very strong. The tibia is the larger of the bones. Contrary again to these people who write the powerpoints it, we, we did force plates in school uh it, it it takes about one sixth of the weight bearing it's a strut you can do without it it's used a lot when we've had ieds and explosives for reconstruction they'll use the you'll try to make an arm out of the tibia when they've lost a lot of the bones in their arm so you you can sacrifice it if you will we're very fortunate. We got a lot of spare parts. We got 30 feet of intestine. We can do without some of it. We have bones that we can use for bone grafting purposes. Lots of skin, all that stuff. It's like, thank you. What? Hey, check there. You got? I always check above my pay grade. I love spare parts. Got two kidneys, you can donate one. You only need one. You need a quarter of one kidney to be able to function. So why do we have two? I don't know. Hey, I buy it. So, you know, it, it's crazy. The fibula is weight bearing. No, it does not articulate with the femur. There are muscle arrangements. There's not a lot of stuff. The big thing are those styloid processes that are not that distinctive on the wrist. They're big. They're called, they have their own names. They're called malleoli. So you can say malleolus or malleolus, don't care. 
So you're going to see those. The fibula really has a lateral malleolus, which is part of, which has cartilage on it, on the interior of it, that forms the ankle joint, the medial malleolus, the same thing, though it's much larger. So you will see that. The tibia has condyles that are relatively flat, an eminence between them, and that peak is formed by the pull and tug of the cruciate ligaments, that big bump in front of your knee. Wait till your moms and dads, if you're going to be moms and dads, and you have to go to parent-teacher night in elementary school. You sit in those stupid little chairs with the kids, and you whack that thing in front of your knee. Trust me, if you're a parent, you've done that. Eat that. I don't have a lot of faith in that. My oldest, the ship captain of the destroyer, when he was in kindergarten, we asked the kindergarten teacher, what do you think? Well, he'll be fairly average. Okay. So my wife and I at the time, my first wife, looked, we looked at her and go, do you have anything else to say about him? No, I, we're done here. She goes, well, I've been doing this for 20 years. And I, my usual comment is, if you're doing something wrong for 20 years, you're still doing it wrong. I don't take any prisoners. My average kid, Ooh. who is a royal PIA, if you know what that means. So I'll, I'll show you these in a second. There's the tuberosity. These condyles are flat. It's those gaskets of menisci. The intercondylar eminence, or whatever you want to call it. Some people call them tibial tubercles. The head of the fibula, underneath, there's a little notch for it. This is the lateral malleolus. You can feel it yourself right down by your ankle. This is what you call your ankle bones. The much larger medial malleolus. And that's about it. Articular surfaces here and here where it forms the ankle. And you can see the ankle joint here. We'll get to that in a second. So you take a good look. So this is something called a bimalleolar fracture. Sometimes called a POTS fracture. Very common sports injury. There's a there's a photo somewhere in the text. You can look that up anytime. And the foot. Metatarsals and tarsals, simple. Five metatarsals, 14 phalanges, two for the big toe we call the hallux. The other three for each of the lesser toes. Seven tarsal bones. Talus, which is the true ankle bone. That's what the tibia and the fibula grab onto. I'll show it to you in a second. The calcaneus, where you walk and strike your heel, the tuberosity. Behind it is the insertion point of the Achilles tendon, or tendocalcaneus, same thing. I'll show you the shelf called the sustentacular talli that supports the talus. And you have a cuboid bone on the outside, a navicular, used to be called scaphoid, eye bone. And then what are called cuneiforms because they look, they're wedge shaped. And that was like a writing back in the pre-biblical days. Code of Hammurabi, you remember that? We've got to get you guys going with that stuff. Cuneiform, Zoroastrianism. Freddie Mercury is Zoroastrian. Baruch Balsada. My favorite guy in England. Anybody can grow up to be queen. Get in touch with my inner Freddy. So, moving on. So, let's do it in order of significance. We have femur, head, phobia, and catholic tremors. The blood vessel. Greater, lesser, trochanic, and cancer geographies. So, you can have a little line, a little trochanic set of line. This is that ridge, and that's there. Gluteal tuberosity is from here to here. You're going to have that state, that ridge, that's the really ass barrel. Glossy here, these are condyle glossy. These are the condyles, covered in cartilage, rounded. They're very distinct from the ball. This is the fellowships. So when we do tibia, these are, and I have a couple of these that aren't going to be up. This one's pretty good. So here, these have little metal things in this, and they have this little skeleton. That's why it's kind of up. So you can see the condyles, and again, medial malleolus is just that. Medial condyle, very flat, little 
I don't mind how uh, the evidence you got uh, from the cruciate ligaments. That's your shit, if you will. Okay? So there's no muscularity within the muscle. This surface here, we call our shin, it doesn't have the muscle attached. The muscles are three groups, as you can see. When we do the muscle part of it, the minimal layers, you can see, are the surface. We fit. Then you can do it here. I use these together. Give your head up here again, which is scrub. Here, this is that high ankle joint, that high ankle sprain area. That's that tibia ligament. Here, tibia ligament. They can pop with the same one more than that. So that's not just one. Big little oil. And you can see some of the remnants of the foot. So there's the calcaneus, that shell that holds up the tails. This is what the suspect tag is an ally. The Tiger Woods had to get his foot fused because of all the problems he was having in his ear. They fused these three joints. They typically fused the vicular. Tailless and it's called the subtailor. Lots of work. Just adding to this kid. Qualified for extra work. So he's walking. So the tailless is up here. A lot. Very complex baby bone. This is the calcaneal fibrosity history. It's the area where we go with the fingers, with the Achilles tendon attaches. And it's real easy to see on these plastic models. You can see the extent of the talus is the highest. Calcaneus, attaching the tendon. On the lateral aspect, this is called the keyboard. It's like a cornerstone for stability. This is called the navicular. That's the that. So you have two cornerstone bones for medial and lateral stability. These are unique ones medial, middle, medial, intermediate, and lateral. One, two, three, doesn't matter to me. And then you have, this is the tarsal metatarsal junction. This is the list ranking joint, which you hear a lot about. The Cam Newton pattern that we probably did a couple of years ago. Uh, Steel or the Chief? I think was kind of just last season. Yeah, I mean, it, it, you get list ranks. The second metatarsal is stuck back in that crack. It's just the way it's made from the It goes on. Okay. And everything else. Now, underneath, there's two other little bones they don't show here, but they're also sensitive bones to help to stabilize the foot. After the knee, the first metatarsal phalanger is going to probably as complicated as that. Because you have sesamoid bones, you have multiple muscles. I mean, you push off with so much force on it. And I think we're done. We need next week, we're going to spend some time. So you can have some time looking at the bone, somewhat of an open lab for part of it. Because in two weeks, I think we're going to have a bone practical and joint practicals. So I'll, I'll be doing that. So two weeks, yeah, another test. You lucky people. Ah, uh, oh, don't even start. But I sent you. Yeah. You sent me something. Yeah. Uh-oh. I still like the picture. Hey. I, I, it's, it's, me recording. <laughs> you guys are terrible. Goodbye. Thank you. I got you out by 415. Yeah. Oh, yoga. All right, stop recording.